Good morning, everybody. My name is Rodrigo Lopez. I'm the director of P20 Initiatives at uh, Northern Illinois University. Uh, thank you for joining us as part of our SBCT Summer Speaker Series uh, Educator Panel. Today's conversation will be focusing on the elimination of barriers for individual and CTE students. I'll be handing it off soon here to Ms. Shavina Baker, who is going to be our lead moderator, and I'm going to allow her to introduce herself shortly. Uh, but before I do, I just want to go ahead and say a few other things. I'm going to be putting a link in the chat for you all to hope, uh, to sign in. Um, we always love to know who's joining us and where they're joining us from. Um, and I also want to go ahead and take a quick second to acknowledge our other members of the uh, Illinois team, uh, and specific the NIU Illinois CT project team, uh, Mr. Bill Rose and Mr. Ben Owen. Um, if you uh, can join them in introducing yourself in the chat, um, that would be great as well. Um, also, we may have some of our colleagues from the ISD CTE and innovation team joining us. Uh, in the meantime, I don't see them here, but if they do, I just want to let you know that they obviously are a very huge part of this project and have been contributing and putting together this um, panel discussion along with the series. Uh, with that being said, I am going to go ahead and hand it over to Ms. Shavina Baker. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, again, um, if you would take a moment to make sure that you do complete that sign-in sheet. Um, thank you, Bill, Rodrigo, and Ben for joining us this morning as well. Um, I am Shavina Baker, and I am the DEI educator for um, the CTE project team. Um, just a little bit about myself. I've been in education for 13 years. I've served as a teacher for eight and a principal for five. Um, I was also a small business owner as well as um, 15 years in the financial services industry before I became an educator. So um, welcome to you all and thanks again so much for joining us this morning. Um, I wanted to go ahead and if we could begin to share the screen. Um, in the last few months, um, we did conduct a summer series and that summer series um, looked at student data as well as engaging um, CET educators like yourselves. And based on the information that was obtained by that data, um, we were able to put together a series highlighting specifically focus, focusing on special populations and non-traditional um, careers. And in collaboration with ISB or the Illinois State Board of Education and our Illinois CTE team, um, that data yielded three main um, highlighted areas. The first being family and community engagement and post-secondary placement active recruitment of special populations in CTE programs and non-traditional careers, and the one that we are talking about today, the elimination of barriers for individual CTE students. Um, so from that um, series by Dr. Valerie Milton, um, the Michigan Department of Education is where she's from. Um, I am going to ask Rodrigo to uh, drop the link to that um, keynote from Dr. Milton. Three main areas um, were raised in that keynote, um, and it specifically talked about strategies for CTE students. So the three that we'd like to highlight that if you have the opportunity to look at later are the unique barriers for each special population group, strategies and tools to eliminate barriers, and then also being able to analyze data to improve outcomes. Okay. So at this time, I would like to introduce our panel, Mitchell and Jackie, if you would be so kind as to introduce yourself, the school district that you are from and your position. And lastly, what do you love about CTE work? Um, so I'm Jackie Gordon and I am from Streamwood High School and I have been um, teaching in high school now for, this is going on my seventh year. Um, and I teach in the health occupations, so I teach anatomy and um, some of the PLTW uh, courses. Um, I also teach on a college level as well, too. So I've been in education for a while, and I've worked for um, in healthcare for over 26 years and worked in the clinic and worked with different physicians in different facilities. 
Um, what I love about teaching is being able to share what I know with younger people trying to get into this career or different careers within the healthcare field. Um, so uh, I just love the aspect of, um, you know, having technical programs that our students can be able to um, achieve during high school, hopefully, and be able to leave, you know, with something um, and, you know, continue on with college and things like that, but just have somewhere to start, something up under their belt. So my joy is, is being able to pass on the knowledge that I've learned over the years to our younger generation trying to get into this field and hopefully get to where I am now. Thank you, Good Jackie. Morning. Oh, sorry. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mitchell Briesmeister. I'm the Director of Educational Pathways for School District U46. And I have to give a big thank you to Jackie for uh, taking the, the time to come and speak with us today. I really appreciate it, Jackie. So thanks. Jackie does amazing work all no year problem. long and uh, she, she never stops. So big props to Jackie. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and this has uh, just been in U46 for a handful of years, but we've got a lot of great stuff going on. And so in my role, I oversee our career and technical education, as well as uh, the rest of our uh, sort of pathways work that extends down into our middle schools, throughout the high schools, and, um, and then hopefully uh, well into the community with a lot of uh, community partnerships. Well, thank you so much, Mitch and Jackie, for your introductions. Um, I want to reiterate that the goal of this educator panel is to ensure that all students have equitable opportunities to enroll in CTE courses and pursue the pathways that they're most interested in um, that will obviously lead to high skill and high paying jobs. So let's jump into the questions. Including the school day and course scheduling, what barriers do you see students have in your school that limit or prevent enrollment of or full participation in CTE classes? So um, with this particular question, what I'm going to say is that um, course scheduling sometimes um, just doesn't fit you know, students want to take certain classes, um, but they can't do to, you know, other requirements that they need. Um, and then I think one of our barriers is that the counselors need to be a little bit more aware of the programs that we offer and the requirements in, you know, trying to get students in a, you know, a really good fit so the program is more successful for them. Um, that's kind of one of the things I see is just that students don't know what we offer within there or it just doesn't fit in their schedule at all. Um, sometimes we do get those kids that get into the classes that's just trying to see what it's about and then they realize it's not for them. But if we get that early on, I wish we would be able to kind of, you know, put them in areas that they like. So maybe, uh, you know, a questionnaire or something to see what they're interested in. And then you're not really sticking them in a, a class or having them take a class that would be of no interest to them. If I wanna do healthcare, but I don't like to cook, we, we wouldn't wanna put them in a culinary class just to give them a filler or something like that, which is how some of the things happen where our students fall through cracks because are not successful because they're in programs that are not what they're really looking for. So um, just counselors, just getting a little bit more involved just to see you know, what we offer and then trying to get students into that fit. Yeah, definitely. I could share a couple pieces here. So uh, the first thing, this is really complex work, right? It's, it's a big topic and it's really easy to get sort of uh, drawn into details of the main, uh, of all the little pieces that can hold our students back. So the educators that made the most difference in my life were educators that could take a complex issue, break it down into bite-sized chunks, sort of build a framework around it. So for this work, I think about this uh, sort of a, a four ingredient um, recipe. So we start off with awareness, interest, access, and support. Awareness, interest, access, and support. 
And in those four buckets, then we can have the other pieces that we need to address as we're moving forward. So um, when it comes to student awareness, do they know about the programs? Do they know about the certifications that can be had? Do they know about work-based learning? Do they know about um, the post-secondary options as well as the direct to workforce options? Do they know that they're gonna be uh, welcomed and celebrated in those courses and in those spaces? Uh, do they, are they aware of people that they can reach out to with questions? So awareness is a big piece. Uh, so how can we leverage our counselors, our marketing, communications departments to promote that awareness. The second part is once they know about it, are they interested in it? Um, do they have uh, a genuine interest and have they had a previous experience that they can use to sort of make a reference to, to say, yeah, I think I am interested in that. And are they um, actualized enough to say, well, this feels kind of like, I'm not really sure, but I'm gonna give it a shot. And I do have some faith that I'm gonna be supported and I will succeed. So the interest piece is another one that we have to build. And I see, I see Joe there, so I have to give Joe a shout out for doing some amazing summer camps this year about building student interest and letting them dip their toes in the water to try out um, these things before they have to make that long, year long commitment to a course, right? So the work he did in D300 is a really great example of that. The next thing is access. So that's a big piece. So that's sort of the subject here. Are there financial barriers? Are there um, barriers that the students look into that court classroom and they, maybe they see it's all a bunch of males? And they're like, wow, I'm not sure if I really am gonna access that. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be welcomed. I'm not sure if I'm gonna feel comfortable. So that's a conversation that has to be had very um, clearly and, um, and just uh, over and over and over again. So in our marketing materials, everything like that. Uh, other pieces of access, uh, when we're looking at our CTSOs, are there transportation issues? Do the students have other obligations uh, after the school day? So how can we roll as much of this work as possible into the school day to promote that access? And then the final piece is um, support. So once our students are in the pathway, they jump into that intro introduction course. Do they know how they can receive support, not only in their CTE courses, but in all their other courses so that they continue to succeed and be successful and they're able to complete a pathway, they're able to participate in work-based learning, they're able to qualify to take dual credit, qualify to be in those AP courses, because we all know that if a student becomes credit deficient, that is gonna severely limit their ability to take the electives that can be really high leverage uh, to get them down that career pathway. So those are the four pieces that I like to think about when I'm talking about this work, awareness, interest, access, and support. And then from there, you can really just drill down in each place and, um, and really clearly communicate to all the people that you need to have supporting you in the work. Thank you so much for that, Mitchell. I think that kind of goes into our next question. Any specific initiatives to reduce barriers for special populations in CTE courses? Mitch kind of knocked that out kind of at the same time, kind of did a twofer with that one. But um, I don't know if there's anything specific um, that I could say that's being done here, um, you know, at Streamwood to reduce. But what I will say is that um, we have um, definitely within the health, and I'm gonna just say in my program, we have, I have like an open door policy. So I do like getting some students that don't really know anything about it. So when they get in there, um, and that means all students, I don't look at, um, I want all, all races, all nationalities, all genders. I want it to be, you know, if you have a disability, I want, you to be able to still give it a try. A um, couple of years ago, we had a student that was deaf that took our CNA program. And um, we purchased, um, through the district, we purchased her a special stethoscope. So she was able to, you know, be able to, to do the things that she needed to do to be successful in the program. And she is enrolled in a nursing program over at Harper. So she's continuing on and not letting her disability or anything like that. So I love that we are allowing our students to be able to, um, you know, to get into these programs and not, you know, say, hey, you can't do it. 
but to open these doors to give them that opportunity. So I don't know if we have anything specific, but I know that um, I think that we're doing a really good job of just kind of um, opening those doors to try to prevent those barriers to the best way we can. Um, but like I said, Mitch kind of hit it with those four different topics because that really, in a nutshell, um, if we can accomplish those, then we would be able to definitely reduce some of those barriers that are, are going on within our schools and our district. Um, those are all great points, and I really appreciate um, your input or your your feedback in that. Um, is it possible for you to speak a little bit about the collaboration possibly with the special education department when you're talking about special populations or students with disabilities as they relate to the CTE courses? So um, I have not personally, um, I've only had one really encounter with uh, one special ed teacher who um, a student was interested in entering the nursing program. I've sat on a couple of different, um, what do you call them, our IEP meetings and things like that, yes. where students have shown interest and definitely by all means, you know, the um, SPED teachers have been really good at trying to help direct, you know, I think this is possible, or do you think this is impossible? Because of course, we don't want to set the student up for failure, but we want to make sure that they're successful. So we've had that opportunity. We were supposed to have a few students enroll this upcoming year. So I'm not really 100% sure yet if they decided to go that route or their parents allowed them to go that route. But um, definitely our door is open to uh, any and everyone. And so maybe that's something that definitely can be looked into this year to, to hit those other populations that we usually don't. Um, but when we market, we market for everyone. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we could do a little bit more to try to bring in um, those of special populations just to let them know that we are here and that those careers are just as well available for them as anyone else. Yeah, I would jump in. I'd say like, the philosophy and the, the the welcoming atmosphere that Jackie provides in her classroom is like exactly what we need to hear. And then as it goes to like a district level in my role, then what I need to do is make sure that I take care of um, the broader messaging so that when that student makes it to Jackie's classroom, then they really get to benefit from her, her knowledge and her expertise. So last year, one thing that we did is we utilized our CTE innovation grants um, to bring in uh, some professional development uh, that specifically focused on collective equity. And we delivered that to our um, CTE staff. We started off in a, in a large format, brought everybody in the room, whether you're a welding teacher, a CNA teacher, PLTW, everybody's in the room having conversations and learning from one another with a, the distinct focus on equity and creating that welcoming environment for all of our students. From there, throughout the rest of the year, we continued to bring in those trainers and we uh, drilled down to individual and small group coaching sessions where our teachers could have people come in and then they had, would have that one-on-one -on -one feedback from someone that was an expert in that area and then also was a non-evaluative um, person where they could just sort of have a safe space to talk about these ideas and you know work through I work through uh, biases, work through um, ideas that are in their classroom so that they could continue to evolve and then have that immediate feedback on what, what they were doing is right and what they're doing uh, can grow from. So that was a project that we uh, really liked. We're looking to continue that work uh, this year as well. Um, and then the other piece is this is really like, this is everybody. So I bet, I'm sure everybody in this call can agree that CTE is for everybody. So that means that um, our access work and our work for special populations also has to be um, for everyone as well. So next week, one thing that U46 is doing is we are have, hosting an equity symposium. It's a five day event where all of our staff are invited. Um, there's many sessions that range from topics on LGBTQIA+. Um, we have things on addressing trauma. We have um, experts that are just nationally recognized, um, authors that are coming in to deliver that training. And what that is, is it's gonna be a way to skill up all of our people and it's gonna create a safe space so that everyone can come to the table and have uh, some collective understanding of what the expectations are 
and what we're working towards in U46 and um, just exactly how we approach, you know, sort of our classroom culture and things like that. So that means our administrators are in the same room, our counselors, our teachers, our CTE teachers, and we're all getting on the same page with that so that we kick off the year uh, with the right frame of mind and with the right um, focus on what's really important to make sure all of our students are succeeding and then feeling celebrated in every one of our classrooms. So that's sort of what macro level and then what really, where the rubber hits the road, just like Jackie said, then when they get to that classroom and then they make that one-on-one -on -one connection with that staff member, and that's where we really, uh, that's where we really see the, the amazing things. Shabina, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Jackie. Um, we do have a question. Um, Barb is wondering if Streamwood and or U46 has GPA or testing cut scores to enroll in CTE programs. No, we, we do not. Okay. Thank you. So we do have, though, um, some, we do have some I don't want to say a prerequisite, but we have like, you know, for CNA, you, you should have a C or better in biology, things like that. It just helps to be a little bit more successful um, in the program. It doesn't mean it's an automatic, you, you didn't get a C in biology that we wouldn't take you. It's, it's not like that. Um, I don't think, you know, I would love to be able to get to a number where we had to, to do that. To, to say, you know, our program is super large that we have to figure out, you know, where our cutoff points could be if there was per se a cutoff point or just be able to have enough to be able to run, to be enough classes to run to take all those students that are interested. That's kind of my ultimate goal, like just being able to, if we got, you know, 60 students that we're able to provide a class for each of those students and not have to turn them away due to the count that we can't, you know, we have a cutoff or anything like that. Thank you, Jackie. Our next question is, what are the challenges your school or district has discovered in breaking barriers for students? Um, I think that we're noticing here at Streamwood, um, some of the challenges is, again, that students are being, um, you know, put into classes that they're not interested in. And then also um, students realizing that they want to take a program that has um, prerequisites. So I'll just use culinary. Culinary, we have, you know, your basic up to we run a restaurant. And, but you have to go through, you basically started freshman year, freshman, sophomore year, and you work your way up to the senior year. And so that's some of the challenges that we have is that, you know, students, they're junior or senior, they, they want to do the restaurant, but they didn't take the other courses to get, to be able to be in that course. And now we have to take them out. So a lot of times students are being put into classes. Some of the challenges are they're being put in classes by, um, you know, what level? as opposed to what the requirements are for the course. So that kind of, that's some of the things we've had to take students out of courses and put them in another course because they haven't met or taken, you know, previous classes that they need. Um, that's, that's one of the main challenges that I see that students say, hey, I want to do that, but I didn't do, take those previous courses, but I can't take them because now this is my junior or senior year. And I, I, you know, so now we have to, you know, kind of, uh, you know, say no or figure out a different route for them. So I think that's one of one of our challenges that I see here within um, our programs. I'm sure there's a lot more. Um, my my biggest thing this year and over the over the years, I've been taking my baby steps, as I call it, and um, trying to get more involved and get myself out there. So like my first couple of years of teaching, you know, I'll say that all of the, I was just trying to get my feet wet and just trying to get in the door. So all of the other stuff that was going on around me, I was more focused on my classroom and trying to get my students in and get them ready. And so now I'm trying to move into a, um, a different phase that I can um, do more helping school-wide, district-wide, and where, you know, I can, we can break these barriers and, you know, get our programs really growing, especially, you know, I'm 
sentimental about health occupations. So of course, um, I definitely want to see that grow additional pathways and things like that. So that's another thing. I think we, we just don't have enough pathways. I think that's another challenge that we have. We have a lot of programs in healthcare and we've got things on the table. I just want to see them move so we can offer different programs for students. When we only have a couple of doors, you don't have a lot of choices when students say, hey, I want to do this, but you don't offer that. Or do you, are you thinking about offering this? Um, so, I, you know, that's one of the challenges. I think just being able to have more opportunities for the students to be able to, to get involved with or interest in. And I'm sure Mitch can speak a little bit more about some of the district challenges, but um, yeah, that's just what I see here stream where we don't have some of the, we don't offer all of the same courses at all five of our high schools. Um, so maybe, you know, there's two classes taught in my school, but this school, one of the other high schools may teach all four of the classes. And so that's what I want to do. I just want to be able to get it where we're, we're all, you know, we got that door open at all five schools. Where's that opportunity for, you know, all of the students to continue to go on. And so definitely that's something that, you know, we'll, we'll talk with and I'll probably be nagging Mitch about sometime throughout the years of, you know, us growing and, and getting us a little bit further than where we're at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that definitely makes sense. And we all know sort of like enrollment drives a lot of, uh, a lot of the creation of those courses and things like that, uh, especially when you get to that third or fourth level course. I think one of the challenges or areas of growth uh, for us and, and most districts is really looking at that, um, you know, the gender equity of, of programs and, and trying to move in a, into getting that to be a little bit more balanced. And we are trending in the right direction and we're doing, we're doing the work, but uh, it takes a while, right? So there's, um, there's biases that our students bring in and, you know, there's, there's family biases that we also have to address. So I think that's part of our larger goal. Uh, you know, you just set your sights on every student feels celebrated in any uh, door that they open in the school. And that's, that's where we want to get to. So that's, if, uh, you know, we look at all of our programs and we just want to look to continue to build that balance. Um, look to address it in our marketing. We're looking to address it in our professional development. Um, and then having a lot of conversations with people too, developing our, our counselors, developing our, having sessions with our families um, so that they come in and they, they can see that this, these are all viable options for their young people to participate in. Um, you know, we don't want to say no to anybody uh, in, in any of these programs. Thank you. It does um, sound like you have a very well-rounded program that is inclusive, and I really do like the fact that you're looping families in as well um, to make sure that um, you're addressing the needs of not just the students, but the questions that families may have. Um, before we go to the next question, um, Joe, I believe, had his hand up. So if you would like to um, unmute yourself, Joe, and you can ask your question. Yes, uh, my question was with Jackie with like the prereqs, and I was wondering if that's like, I know you said it's not really in as a prereq, is it just like an unspoken where the counselors are sort of referencing that, or is it written somewhere in like a course selection guide as a suggested prereq? How is that um, done? So for instance, I'll say, I'm, I'm going to just use the CNA. And the CNA, if you look at it like on a district website, if you were looking at courses, it would show you that you should have a C in biology and it and it does say prerequisite. Um, but so it is documented that way. It's it not is just documented. A... It is documented. Um, but we but following it doesn't necessarily mean we follow it because you know a student may have got a lower grade, but they they've done really good throughout and their GPA is really good. It just may have been you know, a bad year or something like that. So I want to say case by case, but no one, as far as I know, has really ever looked at it. And I don't think um, it's ever been where someone looked at a transcript and said, hey, you know, you didn't meet this. I don't think that was one of the, the things I don't think counselors are aware of it. I didn't even, it didn't even come to me until I was doing something or creating something and it just, it ran across me. And plus two, it's a course that I don't teach, but I did find out later on that there was a, a prerequisite. And then like for culinary, I know that there are certain classes that the students have to take 
um, you know, in order to get to the, be in the restaurant. You can't just go in and decide, hey, senior year, I want to go, because they don't know if you can cook. So, um, right. Okay. Yeah, and I would add to that, you know, when you think about this, you know, we want to get to a place where we're not setting up barriers for our students and that we don't have gatekeeper courses, which is something that, you know, is really common, especially when you think about like post-secondary, right? So we're trying to get away from that. So when we think about something and we say, all right, well, we know this student has to be proficient in biology to succeed in this course. Okay, well, that's, that goes without, that, that's important, right? But then we say, did we communicate to that family well ahead of time to let them know just how important this is for them to succeed in their career goals. Did that student and that family know that we have this program a couple years ahead of time so that they knew to set up their trajectory? So they're like, yep, I'm going to keep my eye on these courses. I'm, I know exactly what I got to do if I want to get here. So that's sort of our job as a district is yeah. to let everyone know this is the path. This is how you get to the path. Here's places where you have to make sure that you really are um, keeping a tight eye and a close eye on um, exactly how your young person is doing. And then if they are struggling in a, in a place, what are your supports that you can access? Who can you talk to so that you can make sure that you're, uh, you know, you're nailing the, that biology class so that you're able to participate in CNA and you're able to ultimately pursue that healthcare um, career at the end of the day. Um, and so that, I mean, that applies to AP, that applies to dual credit, that applies to all these things. We need to do that work a lot earlier so that there are not um, barriers to our students getting into these programs. Right. And so is there I, any formal waiver process for students that haven't met or no? Well, that would just be a conversation with the counselor then? We would have to check with the counselors on that one. Okay. Thanks. Okay, well, let's talk about some of the successes that the school district or your school have had in breaking barriers for students in CTE courses. Well, Mitch kind of said this a little while ago, and I'm just going to piggyback that we have some of the best PD courses that district offers, you know, offers us um, in every aspect. And one thing our district is really good about is um, we have one that's coming up next week, I think on the 12th, um, this geared toward healthcare. So we, we have different PDs that are whole, that can benefit anyone in any class. You can take this and you can apply it to wherever. And then they have our specialized PD, PD for us to be able to, to take that and be able to capture what we need to in our classroom and actually be able to be um, useful and help our students be successful. So, you know, they provide the PD for us um, and we have a huge catalog of PD that we can take throughout the year. So besides, um, hey, here it is offered, we can go back at any time, look at these recordings, get credit for it and use it. So um, I think that, you know, we have the necessary tools out there. We just, as, as instructors and teachers, have to, to utilize what's being offered to us um, to help us, us continue to be successful in breaking those barriers. So they're doing a good job of providing the, the information. And then even at the school level, um, we have some really good APs and our principal is really good with, you know, providing us what we need um, in the classroom for our students to be successful. And I'll, I'll just say, especially last year, you know, coming back off of COVID, a full year, basically our first year, um, I, I say it was kind of a crazy year because you didn't know what it was going to look like. Because some students hadn't been in school for a minute. They had been virtual. So I didn't really know what it was going to look like. And so um, I hadn't really did a lot of ordering. I, I want my kids to be more hands-on. I, I try to reach all of my learners, the visual, the ones that are, you know, I can read and learn, but I need those hands-on. And my AP was like, what do you need? Go ahead and order it so these students can, you know, you can do what you need to do. So I can't be successful in breaking any type of barriers if I don't have the tools. So they've been really good on a district and a school level at providing me what I need um, to be able to, um, you know, help my students be successful in my class. So the PDs are awesome. The PDs are awesome. So um, we're on the right track. We are definitely moving forward in the right 
um, track. I always tell people I'm not going to leave and start scratch over anywhere else. I'm just going to continue where I am. And each year is just going to get better and better and better and better. And I'm going to just try to do my best at helping on both levels of what I can do to help out wherever uh, within my program. So, you know, all students get a fair opportunity um, and a chance to be able to do what they what they like. Um, and so that's that's my job. That's my job. And then reaching out and not necessarily begging, but if I need to um, at what I need to be successful. So I have no problems at asking. <laughs> all I can do, all they can do is tell me no. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so one thing that was identified uh, sort of early in my work was that there was um, there's some pretty significant financial barriers in some of our programs. Um, CNA was one where there's quite a bit of um, required testing. Uh, there's the cost of the exam. There's the cost of scrubs. There's the cost of uh, sort of all these things. So the students were, were on the hook for um, you know, literally hundreds of dollars uh, at that point. And then uh, teachers oftentimes were trying to be as creative as possible to try to sort of set our students up with for success, but you know, the support wasn't there. So one thing that we did to move forward is utilizing um, grant and district funds. We're now eliminating those uh, financial barriers to students. So we purchased um, a uniform bank so that students can have um, uniforms, medical uniforms when they go and do their uh, clinical placements. You know, it's embroidered with, you know, our, our U46 on there. We're taking care of those exam fees. We're bringing in people to have the TB test. Uh, so we're taking care of all that. So what our students really need to focus on then is actually um, just succeeding in their coursework and succeeding in their clinicals. Uh, we're excited that next year we're also going to be offering dual credit for CNA in many many uh, of our schools. So that's going to be another awesome uh, way to break down a barrier for our students that want to pursue uh, post-secondary education. You know, they're they're in that classroom and then they start realizing, hey, you know what, I'm taking a college course. So that awareness becomes, yes, college is an option for me. I definitely know that I can succeed because I did it right here. And we give them the supports while they're in high school so that then they launch successfully at uh, hopefully ECC or uh, NIU or another um, college of their of their interest. Uh, the same thing applies for welding program, our ASC. We're looking at uh, removing those barriers for our students earning the certifications so that they're able to succeed. We uh, also leverage grant funds to obtain uh, toolboxes with our EFE so that a student that ends up going to uh, an automotive internship, they're able to check out a toolbox uh, that's fully stocked with everything that they need uh, for that internship experience. So then they, they walk in and they're very proud. They got a nice set of professional tools and they're really able to just fully engage in the learning and then developing themselves yeah. professionally. So it just takes away uh, one more worry or one more reason why they uh, might walk away from one of those opportunities. Those are just kind of a couple of couple of areas. Mitch, can you elaborate just a little bit on how Perkins Five funding has assisted in breaking down some of those barriers at the district level? Sure. So uh, we definitely utilize Perkins Five funding to the extent that we're able to, especially for our students that are, have uh, any kind of financial barrier that they've been identified with, uh, just to support them in um, any of our CTE related courses. Um, so we so we really work as close as we can to the letter of the law to make sure every one of those dollars is spent and going to uh, the people that need it the most. Thank you very much. Well, we know that collaboration with community partners and state agencies and other organizations are very important to the CTE space and the work. Would you be so kind to share some experiences with those um, types of organizations and the collaboration efforts that either at the school level or the district level have been successful? Absolutely. I can, I can jump on this one. So uh, we have two um, major, major partnerships that really drive a ton of the work that we do and a ton of the experiences. The first is with Terry Stroh, who's our director for our regional EFE 
Um, he's really helping us with work-based learning and um, a bunch of other initiatives. The second is with Nancy Coleman and the Alignment Collaborative for Education. So that's a local nonprofit which uh, supports U46 in our students pursuing internships, other work-based learning experiences, obtaining guest speakers, and um, one of our signature events is actually called Explore. So this is a Oops, no, 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 no. which um, oh, we didn't get somebody on something. Which we actually hold every year at the Now Arena. So we're we're pivoting back to in person this year. So everybody, knock on wood, keep your fingers crossed that everything stays good as far as um, uh, our ability to gather in large spaces. But what this is, we, is we bring right around 2,000 eighth graders into a space and we have them meet with uh, local industries and learn all about the programs. It's also a place where we take those local industries and we match them with our CTE programs. So the student says, wow, this is really amazing. I see the finish line. And then we let them know, hey, well, if you wanna to get to that finish line, here's the courses that are really gonna help you get there. And so then they can start um, seeing some getting some literature, they see the faces, they understand who that they, they need to connect with. So right away in eighth grade, they're starting to make those, those plans that are gonna be so critical when they start getting to be juniors, seniors, looking at doing work-based learning, internships, applying for post-secondary education and or looking to join the workforce or possibly an apprenticeship. Um, so those are a couple of the things that we, that we partner with. Of course, Elgin Community College is an amazing partner. NIU is always an amazing partner for us um, in developing a lot of different career pathways initiatives as well. So uh, we're just really blessed in this area to have a ton of support. This work doesn't get done just at the district level. It doesn't get done just in the classroom. It really takes the entire community coming together to, um, to drive these outcomes for our young people. Jackie, do you have anything that you'd like to add? No, Mitch hit all of that. He did. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing that experience um, and that partnership with all of us. Um, surprisingly, we are at our last question. What kind of innovative practices do teachers in your school or district use to address barriers in the classroom? So we know that um, as teachers, one way is not always going to be the best way. And so, I, like I said, going to my seventh year, and even though I have lesson plans that I have in place, they're always tweaked every year depending on my students. Um, so I've had to get creative. Um, I do collaborate. I'm, there's two of us to help our teachers at Streamwood, and then we have five other uh, or four other high schools that um, are within our district, and we collaborate um, together. We share um, different techniques. We share exams, um, lesson plans, what worked, what didn't work. Have you tried this? Um, I've looked at some YouTube videos. Um, I'm in a PLTW community, of course, on Facebook, so we share a lot of information. Um, the best way to be able to learn is to learn from others who are doing the same thing that you're doing. And you just kind of take what they do sometimes and you tweak it to your own class. Or um, I've made some videos, just whatever works because you have to get creative and the class has to be fun. If the class isn't fun, then the kids are not going to want to learn and um, you're not going to want to teach the material because it's boring. So, you know, it's just another lesson. If you figure that, if you go in and the teachers, you know, kids just come in and say, oh my God, it's going to be another ed puzzle. And, I, you know, I, you know, so you have to get creative. You have to get the kids involved. Um, so I usually just kind of see what my kids like. And, and I did some different stuff, like open different pathways and doors for kids to do projects. So, um, Maybe you, maybe you are a Google slide person. Maybe this person says, you know, I would prefer just to get up and do an oral presentation. So I try to give students a little, um, cho a choice um, of different options. I put out surveys, hey, how would you like to be assessed? It's just to kind of see, you know, um, because sometimes 
a test on paper is not the way for everyone. So you have to, as long as I'm meeting the standard and the student can show me that they can do it, it may not be test form. Maybe test form is not um, really good. I, I've had students that had language barriers that I've had to go through that, you know, you may say, oh, they know that, but they don't necessarily know it until you actually go over it and explain it and put it in a way that they understand it. Mm -hmm. So how they, how they, say it to me or explain it to me may not be traditional, but they're still getting the concept. So I know that they can move on. So, you know, um, I just try to keep my mind open and get creative and not always think that everything is just a, an exam. So we have to get out the box with our assessments and being able to evaluate our students in, and I say sometimes out the box. So um, I even had a student that did a rap um, on the, on the heart and it was awesome because it was his way of learning. And so however you did it, it still cost, it still was the concept. He, but it was just in a way, and actually I think the class kind of got a little kick out of him actually getting up there and making a rap out of um, the different uh, parts of the heart. So my door is always open to different things. So I'll just say, collaborate with um, your coworkers and not necessarily all this in health oc. I've learned a lot from, uh, I have a business background too. So I've learned from my business teachers. I've learned some of, you know, some of my other friends that, that teach other classes, of course, science classes. And so you can take some of the stuff out of, you know, that other teachers use and bring those in into your world as, as well. So I'm trying to get more back to that, um, putting it back on the students as opposed to being more of a facilitator and let the teeth, you know, kind of switching the role um, because no student wants you to sit there and talk for 50, min 50 minutes. I don't want to hear anyone talk for 50 minutes. So the ideal is, you know, being able to get that assignment out and seeing and actually being able to go around and help the students at, at whatever. So you, you just have to get creative. So I use who I have in the school and then my other coworkers and then of course, wonderful, the world of Google. So um and you too i'm good definitely that, that that was really well said jackie i agree so you know what i heard is jackie really understands her standards she understands her success criteria and then she's able to do those uh, formative assessments to really see if her students have learned uh, and so that's the big shift right i mean it shouldn't be a big shift but it is in some classrooms where we're going from the idea of did I teach it to did they learn it? So so Jackie exemplifies that. So really a focus on student learning is, is really critical. And um, how can we reliably assess that every single day? So we're not allowing anyone to fall behind. So that's a big piece. So U46 has partnered with um, Learning Sciences International to really do a deep dive and some serious professional development and quite a bit of support for um, all of our classroom instructors to, with a real focus on developing and encouraging student agency, a focus on student learning. So this is a multi-year um, project that we're, um, that we're well on the way to. Uh, one component that we're gonna see quite a bit is um, a focus on um, sort of the documenting daily learning, right? So uh, teachers able to to take those quick check-ins with students to see all right you know it's it's even more advanced than a um it's more advanced than an exit ticket because you're taking that information and then using it for instruction the next day right so really that quick turnaround that quick feedback so that you can continue to drive um student learning uh, the other piece that we're doing is what we call uh, academic teaming so this is really a pretty big shift where we're changing the classrooms from being uh, very much uh, teacher-centered to very much student-centered. And the students are gonna be the ones leading their learning, uh, working in small teams. And then eventually as it evolves, the teacher really becomes the facilitator. So what that's gonna do is really make sure that uh, all students are being engaged. We're work developing our SEL skills. We're developing the idea that students can move at the pace that is uh, the most comfortable for them so they can really accelerate. And then also, um, you know, just really developing the idea of the students owning 
their learning and then um, continuing to grow as a collective classroom. So that's one of the, the most innovation in, innovative things and it's slowly working its way up to the high school and we're really seeing some, uh, some really amazing gains in, in what our students are doing in the classroom so far. And all that's gonna be permeating throughout our CTE programs as well. Thank you so much for sharing about those strategies and um, best practices. Um, at this time, I would like to open the chat up for questions. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. I'm just going to add one quick thing um, that we do at Streamwood um, or have done is that we hold what's called booster lessons and we do this once a month um, within the classroom and we spend maybe about five, 10 minutes on it. And basically it's based around things that we want to hear from the students and gather that data. So, you know, if it's dealing with engagement, if it's dealing with um, maybe um, emotional, in, you know, just stress, things like that. So we want to hear back from the students. Do we have Google Forms and then you know, we have teams that take that data and, and, and we try to see, you know, where can we um, assist or meet our students? Because again, if we don't know the problems, we can't help break the barriers. So, you know, sometimes students don't always tell it to us face to face, but they can, they don't mind writing it down and, you know, and there's no name on it. We did sticky notes and just turn all the sticky notes in and we've had like boards outside just to hear and see what students want. Again, sometimes, you know, raising your hand, saying something is more of embarrassing because you don't want anybody to know. Um, sometimes students don't come up to us and tell us, you know, um, you know, I have no internet at home, so I can't do my homework or, or things like that. So we, we don't know where our students need us sometimes until they tell us. You just always, you just assume like you just didn't do it or, you know, whatever that may be, you know, their lights may be off at home or they could be homeless and we don't know that, you know, we don't, you know, as a teacher don't get that information. So, you know, it just may be some other barriers that are happening within this student's life that's preventing them to do the things that they need to at school. So those are some of the things we're doing too, just trying to, to see where students need us at and, and, and then we're able to help address those situations as well that are in the classroom. All great points. Thank you so much, Jackie. We do have a question from Michael. Um, you mentioned dual credit. What did your district have to overcome to get dual credit for CNA? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, it's, CNA is a unique program since it is um, very tightly controlled by the Illinois Department of Public Health. So mm -hmm. what you might find is if you already have a teacher that is IDPH certified, and you already are fulfilling their needs as far as curriculum and um, delivering the required skills through an approved um, clinical experience, you're gonna be pretty close. So then when you can, when you look and you start the conversation with your uh, post-secondary partner, things that you're gonna have to review is alignment of your resource, specifically textbook or anything going along with that. You'll have to have your um, instructors approved so that they can meet the um, adjunct requirements and typically if they're meeting those IDPH requirements they they most likely will meet um, the dual credit requirements for that as well um, and then at, at that point you know you really just have to start doing a little bit of training for your people to make sure they understand um, the requirements that that post-secondary institution is going to have uh, as far as grading and um, creating a, an appropriate syllabus the enrollment pieces uh, which will ultimately have to take place uh, sort of at a district level for those costs involved. But when it comes to um, pivoting to dual credit, that is one where you, if you're already following the IDPH guidelines, uh, you're probably going to be in a pretty good place to make that happen. Thank you for answering that question for us, um, Mitch. Are there any other questions that we have for our um, our guests? I don't want to close out without you. Um, Shabina, before we 
as we wait for questions, uh, Mitch, if you don't mind, I'll jump in just because obviously I was just recently at ECC. I think for those um, who may be listening from post-secondary side, I don't know that we have anyone here today, but um, it's also beneficial for school districts to know this. Um, internally, it also is critical that those partners on the post-secondary side are doing their best efforts in communicating not only the importance of the partnership, but also the logistics associated with what Mitch referenced in terms of the IDPH and how important it is to ensure that that is leading the development of those opportunities. And so, you know, obviously uh, CNA in specific is different than any other CTE opportunity and implementing the program can have just many different variables. And so um, IDPH should be the guidance in terms of how the faculty and both ends are collaborating, uh, the resources that Mitch talked about, uh, even down to the classroom policies that the district may be um, using and how that may also reinforce the benefits of dual credit or really, I think, the development experiences that students are supposed to be gaining from that dual credit experience. So, um, and oftentimes that just takes a lot of effort to be able to make sure that the, the your colleagues internally are, are keeping up, up to par with um, that understanding. Thank you so much, Rodrigo, for that. Um, at this time, I want to um, thank everyone for your attendance today in this education panel. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to um, talk about best practices to ensure that all students, um, especially those for our special populations and non-traditional pathways, um, have equal equitable access to CTE courses. And um, if one of my team members could also drop in the chat, um, our professional development calendar. Um, if you have anyone that may like to attend as well, we would love for you to attend those um, in the future. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us today and I hope you guys all have an amazing day. Thank you.